Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe here from East Makostan. Hello. We continue the story of Zak Saroth. So we're going to go from 17 to 20. The company is full of tension and apprehension as they battle on two different sort of platforms. And it is one of the more humorous battles as the companions basically become the Monty Python knights of the round table. We could tell that this was one of the parts where it was part of the RPing. A few people landing on Flint. Eh, he kind of deserves it. On the other hand, we have Riverwind here, who's basically useless. I just like that partway through the battle, you just have Raceland just uh, sticks his staff into the mechanism to stop the two platforms in midair. I can't help but think Raceland's probably annoyed by this point with Riverwind, at least at that point in the battle. That said, Karamon soon almost screws everything up when he tries to get to the other platform and nearly gets a few people killed. That's not one of his wiser moments. Moments. And we've got Raceland, who before the battle had charmed some gully dwarves. I mention it only now because Boo Boo's going to be coming up in terms of something she does. The thing about the gully dwarves is Flint hates them because they outsmarted him years ago and they imprisoned him, which shows how smart he can be sometimes. I love him, but like, come on, dude. You got outsmarted by gully dwarves. The gully dwarves are really pitiable with how they're being treated and how they basically survive eating rats and whatnot. I know a lot of people don't feel sorry for them, but whenever I read the parts with the gully dwarves, I always feel a certain pity for them. The companions... Primarily Sturm and Tannis exchanging worried, horrified looks, thinking he could have done this to us at any moment. This likely only works on the weak-minded, though. Raceland could really do that to Sturm and Tannis. Maybe Flint, but not Sturm and Tannis. I couldn't resist that joke. I, I, I don't think it would work on Flint, to be quite honest. Flint does have a pretty strong will. Because of this charm, after the battle, Raceland decides just to jump down and Boo Boo panics and almost throws herself overboard. Goldmoon, for her part, doesn't like heights, does not like high places in any way, shape, or form, and does not really look forward to jumping down, but this phobia never comes up again and is just a one-off. It also has no bearing on the plot, and she climbs down anyways, so it's not a phobia. This, this just feels like, I mean, no offense, but Waze and Hickman were struggling to characterize Goldmoon and just went, let's give her a random phobia. Okay, this. Yeah, okay. And then they forgot about it because it was not important. See, this is what I have a problem with when it comes to Goldmoon and Riverwind. It's just flaws are introduced and like the idea of the fear of heights is a really good idea and should have been used later, but it never really comes up and nor are any of Goldmoon's flaws later to really have any bearing whatsoever on the character or on the plot. It's obvious Waze and Hickman had no interest whatsoever in, and that frustrates me because there's a good character in there. And I find it funny that it's not Riverwind that goes to try and assist her, her to the best of his ability, but it's Sturm. Okay, it was supposed to be about Goldmoon, but it just turns into a scene where you get to see Sturm and Tannis. And that frustrates me. That said, a moment in chapter 19 where Boo Boo obviously thinks Tannis is a little nuts. And the com other companions are idiots. Ouch. Because they keep asking about the dragon. She says, do you want the dragon? No, but about the dragon. And you have Raceland. No, we don't want the dragon. Okay. So about the dragon, where is the lair of the dragon? So you want the dragon. Like this entire thing goes on for like a page. And it's just like, you, you kind of understand where Boo Boo's coming from. And they're not even listening to how Flynn pretty much commented. Communicating with them is difficult because they're not the smartest. They're not the smartest folk around. And Flint, much as he says they're as dumb as doorknobs, it is funny that Boo Boo thinks she can do magic with, let's say, her dead rat. And Tass is like uh, a mechanism to the hidden door. And you've got her also thinking her dead lizard, I think it is, that can cure Raceland's cough. It, it's really quite funny. That said, uh, Kassanth shows up and of course Sturm wants to fight Kassan. Although I like how by this time Sturm just despises the Gully Dwarves. Well, maybe not despises, but he's just like, you know what? They are dumb. I don't want anything to do with them. He doesn't want anything to do with them because he's like, oh my gosh, they're so dumb. Tass later ends up giggling and it's hard not to giggle with him. When you've got the knocking code between the Gully Dwarves with how it's like, you're supposed to knock this many times. I knocked that many times. No. And you got Boo Boo shoves her way in despite a password problem. So the Gully Dwarves don't even do the code thing or the knocking thing right because they're too um, slow. Apparently the lifts were originally invented by Glungu Bulp who was pretty much the founder of the Gully Dwarf town and became the... Glungu Bulp became a hero and was proclaimed High Bulp by unanimous decision. The chieftainship of the clans had remained in the Bulp family ever since. The Sluds were jealous of the Pulps and claimed that Pulps 
blood was mixed with gnome blood. A claim that doesn't have any weight to it, but when you actually see High Bolt, you kind of get why they would make that kind of claim. He's not built like the other gully dwarves. He's cunning. Now, Boo Boo is probably the smartest of the gully dwarves, but Fudge is the cleverest. Actually, I find that he's someone who chills your very blood to an extent because he manipulates the companions and outfoxes them. And I'm not shaming like Tannis and the rest for that. Fudge proves himself cleverer than them. There's a reason why Boo Poo pretty much told the group, Hi, Bolt knows what you want. She thinks that. Fudge at first is confused and thinks that the companions are servants of Kisanth and that they've come to kill him. But once they're calmed down, decides to betray the dragon, Kisanth. As to the character's motivations in the battle that's to come, the companions decide that Raceland is the most powerful companion and so he should go face the dragon alone, which is fair. He is the strongest, but he's also the most vulnerable. So this is a bit of a weird decision. Raceland, on the other hand, as a, as a condition, he wants his brother to get him the Marine Blue book of Feast on Dantelus. This might sound weird, but I actually think it's a worthy reward, considering he's going to go basically on a suicide mission. It was one of the first spell books of Feast on Dantelus. This is the first time we get the mention of Feast on Dantelus in Dragonlance history. Caramon is a little reticent because, well, he was a black robe. This makes Tannis a little suspicious of Raceland, but it's like, dude, you hired him to go on a suicide mission and kill himself. And then you get annoyed when, you know, he wants a reward and he's demanding that his brother go fetch it for him. Now, he doesn't know what Raceland wants, but he's suspicious of what it is. I just find that, it's like, you know what? It is funny how Raceland's the most loyal companion. Raceland is the one doing things for the group. So that it's very interesting how Raceland is perfectly neutral. He does good and evil deeds depending on what the companions want him to do, but generally he, he sticks to his loyalties to them. That said, he is a bit of a snarky guy who's hard to love because, you know, Raceland is a hard to love person. Look at how he treats Caramon. And we get the end of the chapter with Kisanth essentially attacking them after having taken Raceland hostage. The speed with which Raceland was defeated is rather remarkable because, wow, he seems to have really face planted within minutes of running into the dragon. That said, the dragon was alerted to the arrival of the companions because of Fudge, who betrayed them because he's a clever jerk. Yeah, I know it's wrong of Fudge to have done what he did, but wow, you really gotta admire his cunning. Like, just his IQ there. Like for a gully dwarf, he's he's probably something like almost a genius, nearing to average human intellect or something. Except he uses cunning for self-serving purposes. That said, he loves clothing, obviously. They just messed it. The kingly halls are a mess because of the gully dwarves trying to paint them. What did you think of these chapters? They were actually quite entertaining. Outside of my griping about the barbarians, the characterization in these chapters are, is really good. If you enjoyed this video, do feel free to smash that like and that subscribe button as though you were Theros smashing the Dragonlances into shape.